Hi, Saviana. Welcome to What If I Say Yes. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. It's a beautiful day, sunny. I'm happy. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you, Saviana? Thank you for inviting me first to speak with you. And um, yeah, I'm a playwright, a poet, and um, an educator teaching at Ithaca College. I'm originally from Romania. I grew up there. I went to school there. I was in a revolution against the dictatorship of Ceausescu. I was there in the streets as a college student. Then I worked in the free press of the 90s in uh, Bucharest. And then in 2001, I kind of decided to start all over again, <laughs> although in Romania I was um, a, a sort of established uh, uh, writer and journalist. Um, I came to the US, uh, I came to New York just two weeks before 9-11 um, with a Fulbright Fellowship to study, basically. I chose to come uh, as a graduate student in performance studies and then dramatic writing at NYU, T School of the Arts. Uh, so yeah, I'm some, some sort of a lifelong student <laughs> as well as um, a writer and um, an educator. I'm going to have to ask you, you said two weeks before 9-11. When the attack happened, were you about to leave it, leave everything and go back home? And I'm asking you because Carlos and I moved to New York City in 2000. So we were there and I was this close of just saying goodbye United States and I'm going back home. Well, it was the other way around for me because I was so determined to learn something and start from scratch as a writer in English and study performance studies. I was so obsessed with not uh, uh, not, not, not going home, but um, staying in New York and um, being part of that New York fabric. For me, 9-11 and I was there downtown at NYU and seeing all those people coming uh, with those faces full of ash. And uh, it was really so powerful powerful that I felt a sense of community with the New York City, with the wounded city. So I felt I was belonging there, you know. I was thinking New York City is this kind of city of, yeah, people who were born in New York, but also people who come over there. New York City is such a welcoming city, I think, for, for immigrants, for foreigners, for people coming from all over the U.S. and the uh, uh, and, from the world. So for me, it was the other way around. I didn't go back to Romania because I was afraid I wouldn't get a visa to come back. So I didn't go back to Romania until uh, 2005 with a project. I was so afraid that if I go back, they're not gonna let me in <laughs> back in the US. So I was like, no, 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 I'm finishing this. I'm doing my performance studies master, my MFA in dramatic writing. I'm starting as a playwright. So I kept postponing actually going back to Romania. So yeah, absolutely the other way around. <laughs> Feeling like, oh, I'm a New Yorker now. I was here when that happened. So I need to be here. <laughs> wow, what an interesting perspective. Thank you for sharing. So um, before we go to the what if I say yes moment, can you tell the audience how we know of each other or how we know it? Well, we don't know each other personally, but how we know of each other. Yes, your husband, Carlos, is a colleague of mine at um, Ithaca College, a professor, and uh, we spent so many days on the bus to Ithaca College when he was talking about you and uh, your daughter. So I got to hear a lot about you. I feel I know you. <laughs> I know I know you from, from Carlos. So yeah, Carlos, I think, um, is a dear friend and the person I really admire, one of the great um, uh, minds in terms of uh, political studies and thinking about the world. So I really, yeah, I really appreciate it to have a chance to, to talk more. And he's one of the few people that I felt like I can talk about such many things, uh, such a cosmopolitan mind and deep mind. <laughs> and so I know of you because of the things that Carlos was telling me. <laughs> um, all of the conversations you've had each other, but he also uh, was reminding me today that 
you have invited him to, you invited him to, um, there was a, an event that had to do with poetry and he shared a poem I think he wrote. Uh, yeah. You invited him to be a discussant on, after a play that he wrote. Um, like there are several instances where you have invited Carlos to be part of whatever you do or believe in. And that it's, I mean, it's a huge range of things. So what I know of you is that you're super creative, super nice, super welcoming, and open to new ideas. Thank you. Yes, of course, I invited Carlos. As I said, he was one of the, the few people I really considered great around here. And I was doing different things. I was doing, um, and I've been doing in New York City. I founded an alliance called Immigrant Artists and uh, Scholars in New York. And I've been doing for more than 10 years some events at the Eureka and Poets Cafe and other uh, uh, venues in New York City, uh, events called New York with an Accent or Global Poetry Series or Liberties daughters, uh, immigrant uh, women's monologues. So many, many events um, focusing on in between us on immigrant artists and scholars on uh, multi-rooted uh, artists and scholars. And here in Itaca, I I've, of course tried to do similar things. So I did um, uh, an event called Global Aliens and um, I invited Carlos and we, I think we did it at uh, La Casita de Polaris. And um, uh, then um, I think I invited him to be on a panel after a few of my plays uh, that were done at the Cherry Art Space here in Ithaca. Because um, uh, in New York City and here, um, I always like as a playwright to have a sort of forum and panels after uh, my plays. I think um, at this point, uh, it's not enough to just present the production of a play. We need to, to bring different minds and different people with uh, different opinions to also talk about the issues explored in the plays. So um, I always try to have some sort of a panel with experts, with specialists, with great minds of our time <laughs> after my, my plays. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so it's precisely because of this, of who you are, that um, Carlos suggested that I interview, that I invited you to this show and interview you. So let's go ahead with the, what was a moment in your life when you asked the question, what if I say yes? You then said yes, and you did something. I don't know what it is, you're going to share it for the first time. I'm going to hear it for the first time. So go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, I really liked what your brother wrote and those uh, amazing moments of saying yes, of saying no. Um, as a playwright, also, I deal a lot of these kind of choices that the, my characters and our students' characters make. I tell my students each moment is a choice. So you have to say yes or no. Um, in each moment of our of your life. However, in this case, I was thinking to speak about these big yes moments. <laughs> when you asked me first, I, I've been thinking, yes, I said many times yes or no, but I was um, mostly thinking about this big yes that I said when I moved to, to the US. So I chose to focus on that precisely because it was um, such a big moment and um, I was thinking a lot about that, you know, in uh, Romania, I was up on the wave. I was uh, an established uh, poet, um, playwright, um, even journalist. I was a TV talk show host for the national television. So um, after living, you know, in the totalitarian regime of Ceausescu until 1989, of course, all those restrictions were awful, but being at the revolution and being a journalist and a writer after the revolution, uh, meant an, an extreme and beautiful uh, freedom that I learned to have, the freedom of press, the pre freedom of, of writing. So for us, especially coming uh, um, out of a totalitarian regime, to be able to write and to be able to speak up and uh, uh, have your voice being heard uh, meant a lot. So I was there in Romania, uh, I think, doing good work in, in journalism and um, sharing those ideas and trying to change the society towards uh, uh, democracy. Um, and then when I 
got the Fulbright Fellowship, it was this big moment. Shall I go to, to the US? Um, uh, what do I want to do? Do I want to go just as a visiting artist? I could have done that or put myself out there and start from scratch again as a student. So I think that was a big, big moment for me because in um, Romania and to a certain extent in Europe, I was up on the wave as a playwright. For that particular summer of 2001, I was also invited to be one of the, the playwrights um, uh, at the Royal Court Theatre in London. They had these summer residencies where they invited one playwright from different countries. And I had, I would have had the chance to really develop a new play of mine and um, uh, be known, maybe even have a production at Royal Court Theatre in London, which is like a big thing for new plays. And um, I chose that summer, no, to pack my bags and prepare for New York and to become a student again and come here and live in a small room uh, at International House <laughs> on Riverside Drive in New York City. So how can I say that? But it was like a huge change, you know, from being out there and being invited everywhere on TV, interviews, uh, travels, Paris, London, residence is in Vienna. Uh, so, of course, I'm talking about the years after the revolution, <laughs> not before, nothing before. <laughs> we are not even allowed to travel before. So th that uh, was a big moment for me to kind of, I felt, honestly, I felt like, okay, maybe this sort of fame that I'm starting to have is not good for me. It's not good for the substance of my writing. So maybe I do need to go and start from scratch and learn something in the US. Maybe I do need to practice humbleness. So yeah, that's some um, interesting, I think, thing that I have. I'm trying to be in balance at every given moment and not to feel too important and also not to feel <laughs> too less important. But I'm trying to, to check myself out. And uh, I felt at that moment um, in Romania when sort of all doors were open for me all of a sudden, and I could have uh, become, you know, a big name um, in a, a theater over there. I felt it's maybe too much. So I don't know if it is a sort of uh, let's practice humbleness moment or fear fear of success, <laughs> but uh, basically I chose to, to go back from scratch and become a master's student in performance studies. We didn't have performance studies and we still don't have performance studies uh, uh, departments or areas in Romania. So you cannot study performance studies, which is a relatively new discipline created here in the US um, at the intersection of anthropology, theater, performance, cultural yeah. studies. Yeah, it's more than just the theater. It's, um, it's a, a discipline at the intersection of um, uh, many, a more interdisciplinary, uh, bringing cultural studies, um, critical studies, anthropology uh, into talking about performance, but not just as theater, but as um, everyday life as you know we could discuss many things as a performance so i was challenged by that idea i had a chance to to study with um, richard schechner who is also a great avant-garde director of the <laughs> 70s 80s but well known uh, right now as well so i became uh, richard schechner's writer in residence when I was um, a student in performance studies. I was very happy to, to learn from him and work with him on a few projects. We did a, a, a play uh, or imagination of the story of Oedipus from Yocasta's perspective. It was ah. really great. Yeah, yeah. With five Yocastas of different backgrounds and races. And it was so great to, to rewrite basically the old script that centers um, uh, Oedipus and <laughs> write the whole story from your castar's perspective. And not only one Yocasta, but five, because I had uh, a Yocasta at different uh, uh, ages. So there is the little one, Yo-Yo, who doesn't believe that such a crazy story is going to happen to her. <laughs> then there is the Yoko, <laughs> then uh, Yono, and so on and so forth. So it was an interesting challenge for me 
my first um, uh, play in English at that time, uh, co-created with Richard Schechner, the, the director. I would send him scenes that I would write and he would um, add things. And so that was a collaboration, uh, but a great school for me in terms of my first writing in English. And to, to start with such a great project and with Richard Schechner, it meant a lot. We did our production twice in 2003 and then a bigger one in 2005 at La Mama Theater in New York City, uh, a prestigious uh, theater, uh, well-known uh, in East Village. Uh, it was created by Ellen Stewart um, years ago, and it's a great platform for innovative mm -hmm. theater. And then, um, thanks to um, Mary Jane Campbell, the Dean of the Tisch School of the Arts, who mentored me, I stayed for uh, a few more years to complete an MFA in dramatic writing. So basically, yeah, again, I started from scratch, writing in English, and then I started to feel that I am also a playwright now that um, can write in English. And I think I stayed even longer because I had these opportunities to showcase my work here in the US. Um, and I started to believe that maybe my voice and my ideas and uh, what I can bring to the table could be interesting and useful on this platform, you know, growing up uh, during a communist dictatorship, uh, leading to a transition to democracy, working in press, in media in Eastern Europe, and then starting from scratch and learning uh, about and learning firsthand about the difficulties that um, immigrants have in the US, you know, what mm -hmm. means to be in between two cultures, what means to be looked down when you have an accent. So I started to learn uh, firsthand, but of course, uh, I wasn't in uh, an awful situation. I was still in a, a situation of learning and uh, uh, as a student with um, um, a fellowship from NYU. But compared to, um, to Romania, uh, starting from scratch and uh, not having enough money and living in a, a very small room and international house where I was also an artist um, in residence, I had the McLean residence, so I could stay there, um, uh, transformed me. I, I, I learned Gross. that, yeah, I need to start again and again. And um, I, I uh, as I said, became... Um, I felt in solidarity with the people of New York, with all the people of New York, mm -hmm. with um, people of different backgrounds and races. And um, Romania was uh, such a, uh, you know, monochrome card country to a certain extent. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Roma people were um, uh, discriminated against and still are. So uh, I was coming from a country in which, yes, we had the problems with the dictatorship and the totalitarian regime, but I wasn't fully aware you know, of the different backgrounds and uh, races that can um, uh, live together and what people bring uh, to the table when they come from different countries with their own histories. And uh, I, I learned a lot, I felt in New York and I felt more responsible to bring my voice to, to this platform of uh, uh, artistic voices in New York. So yeah, I kind of feel like I, I said a big yes and a big no at the same time by not going back to, to Romania after 9-11 and uh, pushing myself to do more, to do more. Like I felt like I never did enough, you know? Like it was always something more to do and it is. It is in New York. You feel uh, that you can do so much and um, there's not enough time during uh, a day to, to do everything. And I was also lucky to, to study at NIU and have my tuition covered with the Fulbright grant. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, whatever famous I was in Romania at that time, money I didn't have. I didn't know how to even use a credit card or a debit card when I came to the US. I didn't know what those were. I was, you know, still coming from a communist dictatorship. I was going to the, the shops and supermarkets. I couldn't believe it. Oh my God, so many products. <laughs> so <laughs> they're like uh, cultural shocks after cultural shocks. But then again, learning from uh, other people about their backgrounds, their experiences, I, I realized that I do need to say this big yes, because it's not just about me and um, 
each of us has a sort of their own individual small experience. I felt the need to learn more and get immersed in this bigger uh, sort of soup of mm -hmm. experiences that New York City is in terms of feeding you, in terms of keeping you alive, in terms of, yes, we are all here and we learn from each other and we need to make things better. So yeah, uh, I guess <laughs> this is the bottom line of why I, I kept uh, doing things. And luckily my place um, uh, started to be noticed after my work with Richard Schechner. Uh, the play that I wrote uh, first in my MFA in dramatic writing at NYU, Waxing West, um, a story of a Romanian coming to New York, not myself, a <laughs> cosmetologist, <laughs> a cosmetologist, but uh, counted by the ghosts of dictator Ceausescu and his wife, um, Elena. So a sort of dramedy, tragic comedy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was um, noticed. It had a good production at La Mama Theater in New York. It won the Innovative Theater Award for Outstanding Script. Uh, so I was um, excited that finally I felt my voice was getting somewhere. People mm -hmm. were listening. And then um, um, my other plays um, uh, had productions in New York, uh, most notably at Women's Project, my play Aliens with Extraordinary Skills, <laughs> which is also about immigrants in New York. And the mm -hmm. title is basically the title of a visa <laughs> for artists. <laughs> I thought I'm gonna just put the title of the visa out there to make it <laughs> famous for the posterity. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I think my plays combine these kind of um, serious issues and um, concerns about living between two cultures, be about moving to another culture, about um, class issues and um, uh, other sort of issues uh, concerning immigrants and uh, not only people at the margins or people who are looked at as outsiders or regarded as the others. Uh, so I felt powerfully connected to um, these issues to a certain extent because I was experiencing them and realizing that other people experience them even in a, a harsher way. Uh, so uh, those are my issues, but I always wrote them with uh, a little bit of uh, humor because mm -hmm. as um, Bernard Shaw or Oscar Wilde, they are both credited with this um, phrase. Uh, like they said, if you are to tell people the truth, you better make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm gonna use a little bit of humor, but... Mm -hmm. You, I go usually like ha 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 and then boom, the issue <laughs> hits them. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's I think that sums up a little bit my work there. Mm -hmm. When you first said yes and you decided that you were gonna come to the United States, was it your idea or your plan to make the United States your new home, or were you still thinking of going back? So learning whatever you had to learn proving yourself that um, you can start over and then going back to Romania or not? No, I didn't intend to stay in the, in the US at all. Um, no, I thought I would come for a year and study and go back. And um, I had a good career over there in Romania. I was actually, while I was here in the US, I was offered lots of projects in Romania and in Vienna and in Paris. And, uh, but 9-11 came and uh, unfortunately, as I said, I couldn't go back because I was so afraid I wouldn't be uh, let in. Um, uh, there were restrictions on the, the foreigners. And uh, so the idea was that you might go outside of the US and then you wouldn't be able to come back because um, uh, they wouldn't give you a visa to come back so I was, it's been it's been more than 20 years so in those 20 years at the beginning it was um, as you said it was very difficult to even think about leaving the united states but after things started getting less dark the, were you still thinking of going back to Romania or little by little were you convinced by the work you were doing and by the, the response it was getting that this was becoming your home? 
Yeah, I think the, the second, because uh, in 2005, when I first go to Romania, after uh, I, the first time after I got here, mm -hmm. I was already immersed in many projects. Mm -hmm. I was running an international exchange program for the Lark Play Development Center in New York. And actually when I go, I went back to Romania, I went with the Lark, with the artistic director of the Lark, uh, John Eisner, and a few uh, US playwrights. So I started to do these exchanges. So I felt that I was helping Romania and the US more by doing what I was doing. I mean, um, based on these um, exchanges that I was um, uh, producing and co-curating, uh, I had, um, uh, we had playwrights from the US like David Henry Huang, Teresa Ribe, Carter Copied, um, Tanya Barfield, many uh, major uh, US playwrights got to go to the US and had uh, their plays um, staged or, or read. And I had the US uh, um, producers and critics uh, from the American theater coming over there and um, Romanian uh, writers and directors coming uh, to the US. So it was um, a sort of important work that we were doing in terms of establishing bridges and yes. uh, bringing people uh, over. Um, so, uh, so I felt um, I was needed um, over here to make mm -hmm. this happen. Um, I was a director for international exchange for the LARC for a couple of years uh, with a TCG grant. Um, I was a TCG uh, theater communications group uh, fellow, new generations, new leaders. So it wasn't only my work uh, as a playwright that was uh, uh, happening and produced, but I was um, running and curating different international programs. Um, at the LARC at the time, also the Mexico-US uh, mm -hmm. exchange program started. Um, I was co-working on that with um, other uh, Latino playwrights in the US and the, the LARC. We started also an exchange with Russia and um, many other countries. So it wasn't just my work as a playwright, it was this kind of work of establishing bridges and international connections and international exchanges uh, that uh, seemed to be important for me. That's why actually I didn't go back as much as I maybe would have liked to go back or should have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, uh, it felt like the work here was important, was on a bigger platform. And um, also that I could make it happen from here because uh, the LARC had the donors and had, you know, money uh, to, mm -hmm. to do it while uh, the Romanians um, had only small possibilities to bring people over, to house them, to organize uh, uh, small things. So it felt um, that it was important to be around here. I remember when I wasn't able to, to travel the, from 2001 to 2005, um, in order to still do my projects uh, in Vienna or in Paris, I did mm -hmm. a performance art piece I call a conceptual performance art piece when I sent uh, an inflatable doll to Paris and to Vienna with a monologue that I wrote and instructions for, for people to, to read that monologue next to the inflatable doll that I was preparing <laughs> with labels. So that was also a performance piece because mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a playwright, but I'm also a performance artist and a performance uh, theorist. So I did want to make a different type of case. I put all kinds of labels on the inflatable doll, like, you know, immigrant <laughs> <laughs> and um, that monologue also, I think, was able to, to reach out to some people, even if I wasn't able to be there. Usually mm -hmm. I perform it with labels on my skin. Uh, but uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I try to do to find ways to still do things. Um, what I have I to ask you, yeah, what did your family say? What what? How yeah. have they reacted to you first coming here, <clears throat> staying after September 11, and then staying for more than 20 years? Yeah, well, this is a complicated question, I guess. Uh, again, lots of yeses and noes and choices. My family, actually, my grandmother was born in the US. 
Really? And they, yes. And they immigrated to Romania when she was three because the prime minister at that time, I don't know, they, they were giving them land to come back or something like that back in uh, the beginning of 20th century. So, uh, but so, the parents of your grandmother, were they? My grandmother was born in the US and moved to uh, the, Romania when she was three years old. But her parents, where were they from? They were Romanians, but they were living in the U.S. They were immigrants. Okay. The... What brought them to the U.S.? Work, you know, at that time, you know, generations of, you know, immigrants making the choice to, to come to work in the U.S. So, ah, so the land that the, the government giving them land was here? Was in uh, Romania. That's why they went back. <laughs> okay. No. So if the parents of your grandmother came here for, let's say, a better life job opportunities. Yes. She was your grandmother then was born here. Yes. And then in Romania, they were giving them land to have them come back. Yes. I guess. They were from a minority, a Romanian minority called the Vlachs, who okay. are people from the Balkans. They never had a country, but, but they are a Romanian minority. <laughs> okay. So then they go back. Yeah. Go ahead. So yeah, so that, that's why it's a crazy story. It's like the borders, you know, my family kept passing borders or the borders passed them. I don't know, <laughs> it's like, because yeah, they were from the Balkans. They never had, had a country. When the Ottoman empire dismantled, they started to move towards Romania. They lived in Bulgaria for a while. Then uh, that uh, town, which was at that time part of Romania is now part of Bulgaria. So, you know, those um, uh, wild things that happen with borders <laughs> in Europe and in other parts of the world. So the bottom line and the wild story is that my grandmother, yeah, uh, came to Romania. She and her sister, they always had uh, US citizenship. And mm -hmm. because of that, they were persecuted by the communist regime, but they never, she never got to come back to the US. So she died without uh, uh, being able to come back to the US. But in my family, of course, everything was about America. And I was actually the only one who didn't really want to go to America because really? I thought, no, yeah, I thought I, I was having a good career in Romania. Why should I go to America? But all, all my family, all my cousins, and some of them are now in the US, they immigrated and they are doing well. But everybody was actually obsessed with America during the communist regime. And we would get a big package with used clothes from our relatives in the US because some of my uh, grandma's uh, brothers or the older brothers and my grandfather's sister stayed in the US. So they were just oh. our US family, but we never I never got to interact with them, except for these packages with old, uh, you know, design clothes or whatever, great clothes from uh, the US that we would receive every Christmas. So <laughs> it was such a big deal. So yeah, it was this um, American dream, American myth was very much part of um, our family and <laughs> dinner table discussions. Mm -hmm. and this is my mother's side of the family. My father is a different story. My father was from a, a poor um, community in Romania, but he was an athlete, a, a track and field um, champion. So mm -hmm. he was um, uh, doing his work in good work in uh, sports. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that somehow saved my mother with this unhealthy origin, like they put it, because unhealthy origin in the communist regime was when you didn't, you were not born there, you are not, um, you know, from a family with the, um, communist ties, with the regime ties. Then mm -hmm. because my grandmother was born in the US, my mom was actually kicked out of the university. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a different story. She was actually forced to um, uh, learn Russian, I mean, they told her, well, the only thing you can do if you want to, to have a college degree is to get a degree in Russian. Russian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, so that's another, the whole different story. So my mom graduated with a degree in Russian, but she did a minor in English. So she never wanted to teach Russian. She, she was an English teacher and literature teacher, high school mm -hmm. teacher. So yeah, so, but that whole story, 
yeah it's it's so wild because at the same so when time you said i'm going to the united states they were happy for you they were very happy yeah so they were actually this is the funny thing you would think that they would say no come back no they were like don't come back stay there stay there and maybe you bring us there too you know so it was totally the other way around and um, my brother is still obsessed with the fact that he didn't get here and I got here he's like you didn't even want to go <laughs> did he try to come he did but he didn't succeed oh yeah so um did your parents are, are are they still alive? My mom is alive. And I'm telling you, I talked with her on the phone this past Saturday. And I was saying exactly that maybe if I come back to Romania, you know, my career would blossom again. I have things to offer now that I studied here. I had my career here. And she's like, that's such a stupid thing to say. Stay there. <laughs> you don't see what's happening here. <laughs> Yeah. Did she ever get to come at least to visit you? She did. She did. She came in 2004, 2005. Um, she tried to work. She, yeah, she worked hard in a supermarket. Mm -hmm. But then when my brother's daughter got born, my brother got married. He has a daughter, Annalise, in Romania. So my mom went back to help them mm -hmm. raise uh, and take care of the, the girl. And also she, she never really liked it here, <laughs> but she thinks that, you know, I, I made it, I should stay here. <laughs> and help everyone else <laughs> she liked the idea of you being here better better absolutely mm -hmm. yeah so your yeah. dad never got to come unfortunately that's the thing probably my dad who was my best supporter for my work my writing my everything he even got me the job for the newspaper not he didn't get it for me but he saw the announcement and mm -hmm. he was nagging me you have to apply to this uh, newspaper because I didn't have any like connections with uh, uh, the artistic world or the newspaper world in Romania but because he was such a great supporter of me I, I pushed myself I went to all these um, competitions I applied and I got to work to a main daily newspaper in Romania and because my father was a sportsman an athlete and a coach um he was like all the time coaching me now you even if you know I did some track and field myself but later when he did see that I was more of a poet than uh, an athlete he was like okay now you write two poems and then you open the window and you do these exercises <laughs> <laughs> and then you write another poem yeah so he was okay so my father died at a short time after I left um for the US. He died uh, in January 2002. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, the last time I saw him when, was when he came to, to, you know, with me at the airport, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, precisely because my father died and I was so used to have him there in my corner and waiting for me at the airport, the train station, he was the one uh, for me really uh yeah you know have you ever written a play that's um about him i haven't written a play about him but i dedicated that first play of mine waxing west to him and um i was saying that maybe because i didn't i was in denial i didn't want to face the fact that he wasn't there anymore maybe that was part of the fact that i didn't want to go back to romania because in my mind, he was still there somehow, mm -hmm. but going back and not seeing him where I knew he would be, uh, you know, hurt. yeah, it really hurt. So mm -hmm. those four years maybe uh, were a little uh, sort of time for mourning for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other side, uh, my then husband and I at that time uh, were separated so mm -hmm. that was another uh, reason for me to put an ocean between us <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah my husband Alexandru Kondescu much older than me he was 
a major uh, literary critic and mm -hmm. the uh, artistic director of the National Museum of Literature in Bucharest. I admired him deeply and um, he's a great, he was a great intellectual, an amazing person. And um, unfortunately, he also died in 2007. So oh, see, yeah. there were less and less things for me to go back to. Mm -hmm. In a way, it was much more important and better for me to focus on my work and my career here and my life here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was almost like I was being reborn here. It's such mm -hmm. a cliche, but um, for me, coming to the US did mean a sort of rebirth and trying to do things again uh, in a different way and maybe in a better way. Mm -hmm. Now, the the topics that you uh, develop in your plays, how how they changed throughout the years and, and what do you have for the future? Yeah, thank you for the question. So my uh, New York plays are mostly about immigrants, I realized. Although I, the topic of the immigrant in the US is still present mm -hmm. in most of my plays. However, uh, since I got here um, to Ithaca, um, I uh, learned more about, you know, a different, uh, different families and different ways of living, not just the New York City way of living. Before that, I was just so obsessed to New York. New York, that's all I knew. <laughs> I didn't even realize that it would take, you know, a bus to come uh, here and four hours or five hours. Uh, because um, at that time, I never uh, learned to drive and I didn't have a car. For me, starting again, for the third time in Ithaca, and <laughs> learning a new way of living uh, was another new change. So maybe that's another yes moment, a big yes moment. I said mm -hmm. yes to the job in Ithaca and I somehow left behind the, the freelancing, the artistic work that I was doing nonstop. Now I, I, I do artistic work when I have time. Uh, so now I, it's the new life as a teacher. So that's another big change. Uh, my work changed uh, here in Ithaca, of course. Um, I'm now concerned with um, also larger issues like science fiction. And um, uh, I'm interested in artificial intelligence now, in um, uh, neuroscience. So uh, here in Ithaca, it's such a great college town. We have Ithaca College, we have Cornell, we have uh, the community colleges and other colleges. Um, it feels like a great place, to, in, again, to bring different experts from different fields together. Uh, so uh, in Ithaca, again, uh, I started with uh, writing plays and inviting experts to speak on different topics. Um, I kept some of my projects from New York, like Dream Acts, when I invited uh, Carlos. Dream mm -hmm. Acts is a project that I developed in New York City with four, four other playwrights of different backgrounds uh, about uh, Dream Act eligible youth. And we did it in New York. We did it at the New York Public Library. We did it at the Skirball Center, at the Here Art Center in New York, in different universities, NYU, et cetera. And mm -hmm. then we did it here at the Cherry Art Space um, at Ithaca College. Uh, and each time we present Dream Act, it has to be with a forum discussion, with a panel discussion uh, after the show about these important issues. So here in Ithaca, um, your husband, Carlos, was our specialist in uh, these issues and he uh, gave, uh, gave a great talk on the panel. So now, now recently, as I said, I'm um, interested in these um, post-pandemic issues mm -hmm. like um, science. <laughs> <laughs> I think the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, made me do more research into uh, science, neuroscience, the brain. And uh, I am now in a phase of exploring these issues. I'm working on a dance theater show with Daniel Griezmann Dance Theater Company. It's a company based in New York, but Daniel is my colleague at IC. Mm -hmm. So we are working together and with a dancer from New York City and we'll have a production at the Cherry Arts in May and beginning of June. It's called E-Motion, E-Motion. And it's a dance theater piece at the intersection of performance and neuroscience and artificial intelligence. And um, I wrote a couple of plays that 
somehow um, enter this realm of science um, and uh, neuroscience. I think um, I feel that this is a moment of uh, asking these big questions of are we responsible and what are the ethical responsibilities of humans towards artificial intelligence? You know, mm -hmm. when you create uh, these new forms of intelligence and maybe at some point emotional uh, aspects and consciousness, how do you behave as the creator? Uh, so uh, I feel that in science and technology, at this point, people push forward, push forward, but they don't stop to ask the big ethical questions, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. let's, let's stop for a bit and see where are we going with this. So as you can see, I keep reinventing myself and I'm still the lifelong student that I told you I am. Now I'm studying neuroscience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, becoming a professor at a university or a college ever in your plan when you were growing up and where you, when you came to the United States? No, it wasn't. No. But to be honest, um, my plan was, you know, I liked being a journalist, um, but I was planning to just only keep a column or something like that. But uh, my plan was to focus full time on um, arts, on the arts, on my writing, on publishing books, on going on book lounge tours and uh, traveling to different theaters for my, uh, the productions of my place. So mm -hmm. that's, somehow the way I envision my life and the way it was happening over there in Romania. But um, starting from scratch to write in a new language um, makes it much more difficult to do this kind of work. First of all, it's much more difficult to, to really um, become a fully established and a writer full time here if uh, you write in our second language. And not just that, when you come to the US, when you are eight year old or, or 10 or 15, maybe it's different than like me. I came here when I was 34. So it's a little difficult to, to start from the scratch at that um, time, at that point when in all this industry, after 35, you are considered <laughs> sort of, I'm not gonna say the, the word, but there is <laughs> lots of ageism in our business and in many other businesses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and also, you know, obviously I don't come from a wealthy family. I um, live paycheck <laughs> to paycheck. So I don't really have the resources needed to just um, live a full-time life as a playwright at this point in the US. Um, I would love to, but I don't see it coming. So I feel that um, the next best thing and maybe the first best thing is to um, share your knowledge with, with students and um, um, yeah, uh, create, uh, help a new generation or new generations of uh, uh, artists and writers and generally uh, humans to be, uh, to be more responsible, to have these global citizenship views and to, to become uh, better playwrights or better uh, or more, maybe not better, but to have a larger understanding of mm -hmm. uh, different theater uh, methods and different uh, uh, theater trends and possibilities that happened around the world to stop being, you know, sometimes just focus on the small little world mm -hmm. uh, that might be, uh, you know, uh, the US style of, uh, doing work and and look at um, the other cultures and what <laughs> can you learn from the other cultures. So I don't feel actually that uh, I'm in a uh, I'm in a worse place this way. On the contrary, I feel that I can reach out to to more people to to my students. And um, actually, for a playwright in the US, you can't really make money from your place. So there are two options. It's either you go to LA and you write for TV. Mm -hmm. or become a professor, a teacher. So mm -hmm. these are the two options for playwrights in the US, let's face it, because the money is over there in film, in TV. So 
I don't regret that I chose the second option to, to become a teacher, a professor. I was teaching part-time in uh, New York at NYU at primary stages, uh, occasionally at Fordham. And the um, people over there said that I was a great teacher. The students were really loving what I was sharing with them. So uh, somehow I found that uh, I can be, uh, I can bring a meaningful contribution to this development of new generations, not just through my plays, although I keep doing my plays, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to give up that part of me, but I think that um, it's important to do more than just focusing on your own work and um, teaching is that more. I think we as teachers, as professors have the, the privilege, you know, to, to learn from our students because they bring their energies and their ways of thinking and to, to, share, of our, to share our knowledge. And at this point, I feel like I lived so many lives and I started from scratch so many times that, hey, I have something to teach others. <laughs> <laughs> of course you have. Tell us the names, the, the titles of your courses. What are you teaching right now in Ithaca College? I teach playwriting one, advanced playwriting, uh, contemporary developments in theater and performance. I uh, created, I founded, and I produced a festival of short uh, student plays, student and alumni plays, the new play incubator. And uh, we offer the Golden Egg Award and the Silver Egg Award. So that's more like a festival competition. Again, to, to, to push the students and the alumni to, to uh, bring the best um, uh, work. Uh, and generally we bring a distinguished playwright um, judge or nationally recognized playwright to select the winners. And the new play incubator has been very successful. I'm really happy to see uh, our students, you know, really creating and taking it further. Now they created their own groups to develop new plays, to do um, cold readings of plays. So I feel that what I taught them uh, is really fruitful. Now they, they feel the need to, to do it themselves. And this is exactly what I wanted them to do. And um, uh, next year, I will also teach um, uh, the MTD Musical Theater and Dance Collaboratory. This is our new school of music, theater, and dance. Um, and we are trying to get people to collaborate across the disciplines. And here I oh. come again with the, <laughs> the, teaching the collaboratory and bringing these different disciplines together. Mm -hmm. Throughout the years and now, how often do you get to play, on, to, to act in your own place or in the plays that your students produce? So I, I, I don't act. So I do a new play incubator once a year. Um, now you have I'm, never acted in your place? No, I only do sometimes performance art. I don't act in my place. I, uh, that's so tell, I, us, tell us the difference between acting and performance play. Um, so when I write as a playwright, I write a play, I develop it with actors, and then it is staged by a director in a theater that's sort of more traditional, like people know, a play or a musical. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I do performance art or uh, as a performance artist, uh, you perform, but it's more like your own text. It's something autobiographical. You read or you it's more conceptual, like I did with the inflatable doll. You present something, it's more like a, like a poem with the different aspects of movement. So I don't feel that that is acting, you know, that's okay. your own life somehow. You conceptualize it. And so there is a tradition here in the US and not only of performance artists, great performance artists that um, bring attention to these larger issues, you know, civic issues, social issues through performance art. And um, maybe because I studied performance studies, which I said it's larger than theater, uh, I always feel the need to, to bring these hybrid elements mm. to everything that I do. So 
uh, almost everything that I do is more interdisciplinary, like this dance theater piece right now. But I'm also working on a musical with uh, the Argentinian composer Julian Mesri, and I'm writing the book. He writes the lyrics uh, and uh, uh, the music, and uh, my colleague Courtney Young directs, and we are actually working together uh, to create this musical called Hijas, and um, it's about different yeah daughters, uh, and uh, that that will also have a workshop at the Cherry in uh, May. And maybe that's something that Carlos can come <laughs> to talk about <laughs> on the panel. That's okay, I'm inviting Carlos right now. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah. Um, have you ever done anything in Mexico? Oh yes, oh my God, it's one of my favorite places in the really? world. Really? Yes, so I, I had uh, three plays produced in Mexico and they invited me for some of these uh, openings or and the workshop. So I work with Teatro La Capilla in Mexico City. Boris Sherman is the artistic director. Uh, he's actually a French guy who fell in love with Mexico and created that theater over there. And so he has been living in Mexico City for many years. Mm -hmm. And he's the artistic director of uh, Teatro La Capilla in Coyacan. Mm -hmm. oh, I loved it was my favorite place ever they put me up in a nice um, bed and breakfast uh, on the street where Frida Kahlo lived oh, oh my god Frida Kahlo is like my hero so um, <laughs> it was the best time ever so Boris translated one of my plays from French <laughs> my play Final Countdown Cuenta Regresiva and he mm -hmm. produced it over there at Teatro La Capilla and then I worked with another Mex with the Mexican director Alberto Lomnitz and uh, for the National Theater in Mexico City but we did it also at Teatro La Capilla uh, my play Aliens with Extraordinary Skills that was done in New York they translated it as Immigrantes con Habilidades Extraordinarias how can you translate aliens? But they created <laughs> a company called Los Alias. Oh, I can show you. Yes, yes, please. Can you see it? They created Los Aliens. Yeah. <laughs> and this was the, the plaque over there. They do like this for each show. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to send me a picture to add it at the end okay. of the video. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And this is when they published um, my play, Cuenta Regresiva. When they wow. added. Wow. They did it at Teatro Capilla, Teatro El Milagro. They, mm -hmm. This one, they did it in a few places. So yeah, I had- What quite... years are we talking about? So uh, I used to go more often in Mexico City when I was in New York, because it was also this exchange with the LARC Play mm -hmm. Development Center. So they invited me to Semana Dramaturgica a few times. They do a week when they invite different playwrights. So this was happening mainly, and basically before I came, I moved here to, to Ithaca until about from 2005 to 2012. I'm still okay. in touch with, with them though. So I, I, I keep sending them my place, but I haven't had the chance to go uh, to Mexico City uh, recently. I, I do want to go, but now I have to go to Argentina because I'm writing this music. <laughs> wow, lovely. Okay, so Saviana, now we have to go to the what if I say no moment. I don't know if it's just emphasizing and one of the no's that you mentioned or if you chose a new one, but when was a moment in your life when you decided that saying no was a better option? Yeah, I think I'm just going to emphasize one of the former because I kept talking about them. Uh, <laughs> so I think um, a big no for me was when I said no to the Royal Court Theater uh, for that residency. Because I do feel now, in retrospect, knowing how important Royal Court Theater is, that they would have put me on a different track and maybe a, 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 more, would have brought me more visibility. Because strangely enough, even in New York City, what comes from London <laughs> is seen like, wow, yeah, from London, from Royal Court or from West End. So <laughs> paradoxically enough, there is a good way to get to New York via London. So yeah, maybe <laughs> that no cost me fame and Broadway productions, who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> do you regret having said no? I do, I do regret that one. Because really? 
I mean, because I could have done both, but at that time also because, you know, I was saying goodbye to my family. It was, so the Royal Court residency was like July, August, and I was supposed to be here in New York in August. So theoretically I could have done both of them, oh. but I was packing, I was spending time with my family. I, I just didn't feel it. <laughs> Is that is that an opportunity that opportunity that you could um, have in the future to go back to, or well, not to go back because you never went, but to go to that place and do something with them? Well, it's very much a matter of momentum. At that time, when I was up on the wave and I was one of the considered one of the Romanian writers, that was the moment for me to have a, mm -hmm. an impact. Also, it was not too far from the fall of the Iron Curtain. There was lots of interest in uh, mm -hmm. stories from Eastern Europe. Um, at this point, I spoke at some time, at some point with them, and they were like, but you're not a Romanian writer anymore. You are now Romanian American. You have already emerged. So now they consider me that, you know, I already done, I've already done things and I already emerged. So they and don't... there are no other ways to collaborate with them? Yeah, yeah, I, I could try, but, um, um, Strange enough, all these theaters, they really like to kind of promote things that develop through them in okay. New York and in London. Um, if you lose uh, momentum like that, it's very hard to, to get back because they like to do plays that are developed through their pipelines. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, anyway, I think you've had a very interesting life, even though you didn't get to go. <laughs> Well, I said yes to New York. I said no to London. That's the baseline. And that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for your next life. I remember someone mentioned there's a podcast where um, this woman interviews people about what they think could have happened if they had taken a different road. And so just by talking about what they imagined they could have done or where their lives could have um, gone to or led to, they finish the podcast having like a very cathartic feeling and being very okay with the life that now they have. So maybe you should go there. <laughs> So they go there. <laughs> maybe you should have that conversation with her. Anyway. Oh, Saviana, thank you so much. This has been very interesting. Lovely meeting you. We still don't know each other. <laughs> we have to go out for a, the coffee and drink something. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope you had a good time here with us. And what if I say yes? Thank you so much for sharing your story, your stories. You have many. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. It's like the most interesting, you know, question and the way you frame the whole thing. It's so original and meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. And just a last reminder, please send me now pictures of the things you talked about here. So whatever pictures you want to share with the audience of when you were in Romania, of your life in New York City, of whatever, or your place that are your uh performances whatever you want to share please send me those pictures and I, i'll add them at the end of this interview thank, thank you so you. much for coming <laughs> bye Saviana. Bye.